Ramona and welcome to Ramona Interviews. And with me in the chair today is Bill Safer. Now, he does a program called Hidden Treasures and it is indeed a gem. Did you ever wonder what something was really worth? Now, I'm not talking about the Beanie Baby craze and the Cabbage Patch Doll craze. I know I'm dating myself, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, but Grandma's Antique, something you found in the attic, what's up with the flea market? How do you know what to really look for, find? Well, Bill's here and he's going to tell us all about it. Thanks for coming, Bill. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ramona. <laughs> appreciate now, it. Let's tell us a little bit about his hidden treasures and when they can see it. And of course, it's right here on WCCA TV 13. Yes. Awesome. Um, and we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, hidden Treasures is a show that I, I have on. I've only done seven shows so far, so I'm relatively new. But what the idea of the show is, is to try to get people educated and have the ability to go to flea markets, yard sales, antique shops, and try to find that hidden treasure. Uh, I give them tips. Every show has a different theme. Uh, a lot of my shows have guests, and everybody has a specialty. So I'm trying to give everybody a little knowledge to go and try to find that hidden treasure, either through tips, my own experiences, the experiences of the guests. And uh, we had an antique shop owner, an auctioneer, uh, a woman who is an expert in fashion jewelry, costume jewelry. Uh, there are a lot of treasures out there. People think that they, they, it's gone, that's been done years ago. Right now, somewhere in the United States, there's a multi-thousand dollar treasure waiting for someone to buy for five or six dollars. It's just the luck of the draw. Are you going to be the one to do it? And knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. The more knowledge you have on antiques and collectibles, the more, of your the more chance you have to find a hidden treasure. Uh, my show is on, on Wednesdays, on Fridays, and Saturdays, and Sundays. 6.30 on Wednesday, I believe it's 5.30 on Friday, 4.30 on Saturday, and 6.30 p.m. on Sunday. Before we jump into Googling, eBaying, okay. <laughs> Twittering <laughs> <laughs> to beat somebody to that deal, um, what qualifies you um, to give tips and hints in regards to yard sales and flea markets and auctions and things like that? Well, I've been collecting antiques for plus thir 30 years plus. And over that 30-year period, not only have I purchased antiques, but I've sold antiques. I've sold antiques for others. Um, I've developed an extensive library of books and guidebooks for prices. Uh, I've attended numerous seminars and programs on antiques. So in the 30 years that I've been doing this, um, I've gained a lot of experience just from doing. What is the difference um, between a yard sale and a flea market in terms of when you want to find something? Is there really a difference? Yes, that's an excellent question because yard sales are usually more private sales that are held in neighborhoods. Once in a while, they'll have, it'll look like a flea market, but it's a group neighborhood sale where seven or eight houses will all get together and sell their items, whereas a flea market is usually an organized a weekly or monthly uh, thing like the Lancaster flea market or the old Auburn flea market where there's a landlord that owns a parking lot or a large tract of land. You pay rent and you get a table. Mm -hmm. um, the actual items could be the exact same at both because flea markets are a group of people that bring their items to the flea market whereas yard sales are more done either at your home or maybe your next door neighbor's home. Okay. And is there anything else? I mean, do you go from that to an auction house? Is there anything in between? Yes. Well, what I would suggest is between, before you go to the auctions and after you've done a flea market or yard sale, is to go to an antique shop. Because an antique shop is sort of the mid-ground. A lot of the things that are purchased at the yard sales and the flea markets end up at the antique shops. And a lot of things that are in the antique shop sometimes go to auction. So it's a natural progression. Uh, if you do those steps, it's a good learning process. Antiques and collectibles all have a voice, and a lot of them have a story, mm -hmm. and it makes it so much more interesting if you, if you know the story behind it or the provenance. If you have, my first, the first thing I ever sold 15 years ago on eBay was a railroad pin from the Providence and Worcester Railroad. It was given to gentlemen in the 50s that had served 25 years. And the story came with the pin mm -hmm. and, you know, how he started and what line he worked on and how he got promoted, uh, his family. So that's a lot better than just looking at the pin. Sometimes you don't get the history, mm -hmm. but sometimes you do. 
this is one of my questions, is this a kind of a hard and fast rule about what actually becomes famous? I mean, other than when the person is deceased, right, which right. seems a shame in some <laughs> aspects. But, you know, is it, is it always because it has a historical background? Is it because they were a famous person? Could it be because maybe the artist only made so many of something? I mean, is there a, like, kind of quickie list to kind sure. of look at to figure it out? It's a little bit of all of the above. <clears throat> Certain things are always valuable. Certain things that are made out of gold or silver that have any age to them, they always have a value to them. And then you also have what's hot today, such as when Beanie Babies had a craze. I mean, I sold a Beanie Baby for a lady uh, from Lemonster for $300. And now they're $10 because that was the hot craze. You had mentioned Cabbage Patch dolls. You, the black market in Cabbage Patch dolls was two or $300 for a, a $15 or $20 doll. It's also what's hot at the moment. Uh, standard collectibles, as I mentioned, silver, gold, presidential collectibles are always valuable. If you can connect it to a famous person, then it always has value. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, look for things that have age, and that comes with experience, things that are connected to famous people, things that are made of valuable materials like gold or silver. All those things usually have a resale value. And don't be afraid to ask the person you're buying it from if there's a story behind it. Mm -hmm. Even if you go to a yard sale and you buy a pocket watch, some people just buy it and leave. I always say, was this your grandfather's? Do you know where this came from? Things like that. So that adds, uh, and write it down, and you can add that to the item because 100 years from now, how great is that for someone to find something and with the whole story behind it? Mm -hmm. But always be respectful. Always ask, never demand about a price. And never point out the flaws of an item because some people feel that to get an item, they have to downgrade it. Okay. Like if, they, if they're buying a teapot and the man says 100, and they'll, they'll say, well, the spigot is dented, there's a scratch on the back, there's a rub mark. I had a yard sale one time where a man picked up a camera and we couldn't agree on a price. I wanted one price, he didn't want to go as high, I did. And he said, well, the leather is scuffed, the lens is dented. You know, I don't recognize the name, so I, I said, can I see that? I took it from him, and I wrapped up, and I put it back under the table. He says, what are you doing? I said, I wouldn't dare insult your collection with such a horrible item with so many defects. And I did it on the principle because he also insulted the item, and he was kind of rude. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. You know, who, how can you get a positive experience by acting negative? Mm -hmm. So you have to be positive. You have to be polite. Another thing um, I, I like to tell people if you're going to a yard sale or a flea market and you like jewelry, don't wear, you know, your grandmother's diamond rings and your Rolex watch because the price is going to go up by 50% automatically. They say, no, that price is firm. Does firm really mean firm? Uh, no. Uh, I found that firm never means firm. They'll tell you they will not go down. And then you still say, this, this is $100 and it's firm. And, and I'll say, well, I only have $80 in my budget. Would you really, con could you consider a bottom, rock bottom price of $80? And a lot of times they'll say yes, even though they've just said it's mm -hmm. firm. And uh, also, it's also how you act. If you want something at a table, it's a psychological game, because yeah. you have to remember, they want the most money, mm -hmm. and you want to pay the least money. <laughs> so you don't want to go over to a table, and before you've negotiated with the person, say, oh my God, I've been looking for this for 20 years. Well, the price just went from $5 to 80 if you know you've gotten a treasure, like whether you know, some people know there's experts in jewelry or pocket watches. If you know you just bought a $100 pocket watch for $50, never say to the person after you've bought it, do you know this is worth $100 and you just sold it to me for 50 <laughs> If you go to a yard sale or a flea market and you like a coat, a teapot, and some silverware, rather than paying 50 20 and 30 you could say, would you consider $60 for everything? Right. And a lot of times they will because the bundling or the grouping uh, lets you get more things for one price, and it gives the person at the yard sale sort of more money. I am Ramona, and you've been watching Ramona Interviews. Have a wonderful week.